have changed. They're no longer the simple scrimblow jaunts of yore. Games have changed. They've become vehicles for genuine explorations of human emotion, identity, and ideology. But in turn, we've allowed laissez-faire market price gouging, anti-consumer policies, and abusive corporations to run rampant. Games have changed. When games do good and ill alike, games become lames. Metal Gear is fun. It's a game where you run around and slam dunk a child into the dirt. Whoa! The first three games established a lineage of high graphical fidelity, varied and variable gameplay, questionable storytelling methods counterbalanced by intense integration of gameplay and mechanics, games as storytelling, all set before a modern military backdrop, that and a thousand little details to carve face from stone, as it were. Today we're looking at the last three canon games, MGS4, Peace Walker, and 5, Ground Zeroes included. There's a distinct shift away from the previous entries, you could say Kojima or Konami or whoever took fan interest and ran with it, sometimes for better. The question is, does that constitute theft or conservation? Well, it definitely constitutes turning the series on its head. Okay, so, imagine you're Hideo Kojima. I know it's tough. Try to empathize, huh? You done thought Snake Eater was a fine finale, but foo! Whoopsie, it's incredible, made a couple bucks, and now Konami wants you to make four. And the fans want you to make four. Everyone wants you to create stuff like before, just like Gam Gam used to make. Except now there's serious expectations from one camp, and serious expectations plus your paycheck from the other. And you're developing for the next generation of consoles. And your worst fans not only want you to tie up loose ends, because that can only go well, but they're sending you death threats for trying to step down as director. Is it even possible to win in this scenario? Game Theory, Hideo Kojima is Solid Snake. We're left with a game that consistently, repeatedly tries to regurgitate, recapture, and reframe previously established elements, but this is a formally requested baby, yeah, not a pure love child, so we're doing the Patriots again. We're doing Foxhound again. Fecal Matter. We're doing Naomi, Mei Ling, Roy Campbell, Vamp, every old character again. We're literally doing Shadow Moses again. Okay, but this section ends, so. It's not all bad. It's just frustrating. Yes, some new characters and ideas appear, but they're born from the old blood, and a lot of the old material was fine, wrapped up neatly so it could be laid to rest with a little bow on top of the coffin. But no, let's tear that crap off. Enjoy your parade of corpses. MGS4 directly follows too, so for the uninitiated, Snake's just aging rapidly on account of some birth quirks. Hope you're ready for an uncanny, sad, uncomfortable experience. His nipples. They're sagging. Stress on uncomfortable there. The post-MGS2 world is packed with nanomachines, regulating soldiers to the point that war is a controlled banality. Oh, and autonomous killing machines making cow sounds necessitate sneaking. I hope none of this is terribly confusing. Functionally, the game's a modernized snake eater. It's got most of the same parts, but Snake's schmoove's a little smoother. He can actually handle a gun. It really does feel good to play, at least in the early chapters. It's fun fishing for headshots. It's a comfortably modern game. Damn. Oh, Kojima would love this. No need to pop open a menu for camo, you can hold a button to blend in. Uh, underrated narrative gameplay moment, by the way. This game really sells the war as routine thing, then literally hands you a normalized third-person shooter control setup, unlike any other MGS game. I love those happy little accidents. Kind of doubting the intentionality just makes the game more playable for a wider audience. So strap on your third-person shooter cap and check your damn corners. <laughs> But since we're in the urban jungle, there's no boas to bite. We've got a stress gauge now, because after all these games, it took his own death clock to give Snake any kind of pause. The stress meter will not factor into regular play for 99% of the game. So gameplay's fine. What about the levels? MGS4 starts hot. The early levels are pretty great. You're clinging to walls, popping through doors, pathfinding through a crumbling urban war zone. And it's war you can feel, because it's tangibly hazardous. In the first and second levels, at least, you're stuck between warring factions, and as soon Assuming you don't know about the befriending one side mechanic, because you're a normal person, you get this real smart tactical groove on, weaving through dudes. It's sharp, it's Metal Gear, almost. What's off is the population size. Yeah, it's technically impressive for proper combat to take place around Snake, but the weight of solitude is all but stripped from play. Otacon tells you that there's no reason for you to get involved or take sides. And that's partially true, you're there to infiltrate. Little less sneaky though, if you stumble into the many alleyway spawn points. I am but an old man. 
killing in the infinite spawn hallway. That's some great footage. It varies the challenges presented to the player, and honestly, MGS4 flops in many ways, but almost never in typical gameplay. It's a fun game to play. That said, the later levels fall off pretty hard between an obnoxious tailing mission in a beautiful setting. Oops, that's the whole level. Y'all like Assassin's Creed, right? Assassin's Creed focus tested very well, and the final level, which is like five minutes long, Somehow. Thankfully, uh, nestled between those is the Shadow Moses segment, which kicks so much ass, hits you with the nostalgia from start to finish, gets you wrangling and eventually demolishing those stupid f***ing cows, and ends on a Metal Gear piloting segment. Make no mistake, when MGS4 wants to be good, who boy grabs the 9-iron and let's fly. All of that was most of the good. When the player's in the driver's seat, it's anywhere from an uncharitable 5 to a generous 8, I think. And I hate scores, but you gotta understand, this thing's contentious. People get mad about MGS4. It's been dissected, denigrated, defended, but that's hardly because of the mechanics. It's everything else, really. The only fully novel addition is attached to a new character as well, one who represents the series' narrative shift. Because Metal Gear is all about the war economy now, and guns are locked to the ID tags of individual soldiers. Snake can't just loot and shoot. He needs unlocked guns, and that's this guy's whole game. So you kill, collect, purchase, and power up. It's a fun distraction, loading Snake up with a crazy custom setup. And it feels just as dirty playing into the system as you'd expect. You were always supposed to go ghost in the early games. They were sneaking missions, right? Otacon himself tells you not to fight, but it's almost inevitable. You're part of the war machine, and the additional firepower really helps out later. So show me the money! Like I said, it's not the game. It's everything else. I'm a chef. Shadow, one that no light will shine on. As long as you follow me, you'll never see the day. Little cringe, bro. MGS4 is the world gone sad. It's a cold and vile place ruined by a group of people who are perpetually anonymous and untouchable, and it's populated by a heap of aging characters grappling with their futures. The future of a world spun out of control. Seeing Naomi, Mei Ling, Vamp, Everyone again in this world is depressing, like they can't meaningfully fade away, not while war is being waged. And in that context, the game's narrative base and the story it tells both work, fundamentally. The other side of that coin is, like I said, every told tale, from concept to character, is back to haunt the work. It's the self-suck snake I mentioned before. Metal Gear Solid will not let itself go, whether because Kojima hated having to direct the project, whether because Konami, the fans, or the death threats sucked the fun out of making it, whatever the problem was. It starts infecting the gameplay. There was a distinct rise in personality as the games were made. Foxhound was campy, but Dead Cell was cracked, and the Cobra unit was flat out <laughs> insane. Actually magical. But look at these clowns. Screaming Mantis, Raging Raven, Crying Wolf, Laughing Octopus, again? MGS4 said, okay, let's literally just do Foxhound again, give him Dead Cell's weapons, okay, model them after real actresses so all women make make them all mentally insane, yet instantly forgettable, have them dance for you, and then you cram a buckshot in their eye holes so Drebin can call you up with their extremely sad backstories. He butchered the bodies of the ones she loved. Yeah, thanks, Drebin, but can you put the monkey on the line? At least he's funny. Oh, don't you want to hear my super f***ed up backstory? It's so sad. <laughs> like, how am I supposed to react to these? Why are they here? Sorry, let me get a hit of that metal. Metal Gear Soylent or whatever. I clapped when I saw Psycho Manti! What happened to cool new characters? Metal Gear was so good at making human bosses with that Mega Man robot master design ethos, okay? All different, all distinct, and interesting designs. This is rock bottom for conceptual work, anyway. Like, I'm supposed to clap because I recognize things? Shut up! Damn, I got real uppity about Metal Gear after four games. Good job, guys. You made me care. It's worth noting that the actual boss fights are mostly okay. Like, Laughing Octopus is fun and creepy. Anyone who bursts through windows is not to be trusted. Raging Raven's fun enough, if only because the fight has an element of verticality to it, though it's a mostly boring weight and gun, but not as bad as Crying Wolf, who sadly has all these interesting mechanics, can smell you downwind, but it doesn't matter. Hide under the tank and sniper to death. Mantis is trying to be a worthy successor to Mantis, and well, 
It definitely caps off that segment at an unfortunately early minute count, and that whole self-referential stroke fest culminates in the story explaining literally everything to you, from Big Boss's past, to the Philosophers, to the Patriots, to the Nanomachines. Every element is demystified, and I get wanting to put a wrap on something for good, but it's just not how to write stories. It's like midi-chlorians. You've heard this, right? Star Wars suddenly starts answering the how of the Force, and the mystery's gone. The fun is gone. You don't need to answer or the how, and it sucks because it directly feeds into Metal Gear's worst storytelling habits. The exposition, the overlong cutscenes, both egregiously represented in the excessive mission briefings. At least you can control the camera and see feet. And oftentimes, it breaks up play. All I'm saying is, I was on Twitter here more than any other game. And this is the series that often pulls stunts unique to video games. The Mantis fourth wall break, relying on Snake at the end of two. Lots of little moments have narrative gameplay crossover. This one does as well. All the backlash to Snake's age, to his smoking habits stress him out. Impact the gauge, even if it's for a meme. And the microwave hallway is the perfect scene to cap off Snake's unbelievably difficult life. Show everybody struggling struggling alongside him to buy his chance to die for the world. There are actual diamonds lacing the pile of filth you have to wade through. And I'm not talking about the gameplay, if anything, a much tighter set of cutscenes and exposition, and a story with a smaller scope that allowed the player to play the game might have brought this nearly in line with the others. Instead, MGS4 tries to capture a true conclusion, tries to tie up a million ends that don't even need tying. Just this massive Rapunzel braid of threads and ends up tripping over its own Yippee! instead. Not paying paying attention, scrambling to find solutions. Okay, really brief spoiler alert in case you're into that. Liquid Ocelot jacking the entire nanomachine system is awesome. Ocelot's awesome. No wonder they leaned on this guy in every game. He's too much fun. Meryl falling in love with this guy from the first game and eventually marrying him? I get it, he looks alright, but doesn't he perpetually stink like sh**? <laughs> the final boss, aka Metal Gear Street Fighter, is so incredibly stupid. In the most loving way, the story might be about Big Boss, but the conflict specifically between these two characters is legendary, and I'm glad they got their moment. The entire ending was pretty brutal, in more ways than one. Like, the wedding scene is fine and all, but Otacon's lines about Snake just demolished me. Why you gotta do me like that? This is a wacky ending for Raiden. Look, you gotta remember, MGS2 Raiden was all between the Patriots, this vampire, the bomb defusal from hell, and general cut scenery. This has been one cromulent Whoa! crustable of a day. Jackie, needy, drinky. Yeah, bro, I know you were gaslit, but thankfully this girl boss is here to gatekeep your individuality payoff from two. But at least MGR exists, so Raiden doesn't have to lay down his character arc for an ending. The game's actual ending, Snake in the Graveyard, is probably more meaningful to different people in different contexts. I'm glad Snake got the happy ending, and really, a shortened lifespan's still pretty bleak. Guy deserves a reward for saving the world, but the entire info dump about everything is so incredibly ridiculous. It's laughable, it defies intelligent storytelling, it's this amazing encapsulation of game design and how it ruins storytelling. With games, you can tell stories through text, you can tell them through gameplay, etc. But all of that is for nothing if the publisher wants to rewrite the dialogue over the writer's head, if things get cut in development, if a lot of things. Game writing doesn't always pan out. I imagine budget constraints are at the top of that little writing ruiner list. The stuff that comes out probably could have been naturally integrated with more time, more space, a whole other game, maybe. But as it stands, the entire explanation of Metal Gear Solid is tucked in a narration at the end of an hour-long series of cutscenes. It gets there, but as sloppily as possible. It's a shame because MGS4 does have some really cool ideas and decent gameplay, but now I've got to tack on that nasty bit about storytelling, and you know what? I'm stressed out. I'm leaving this to memes. Wipe this meme from the face of the earth. I'm making Peace Walker a footnote. Yes, Metal Gear Solid Peace Walker, a title once affixed with a shiny five, built on the bones of portable ops and relegated to the PSP. It's the only mainline Metal Gear game with no associated number. The only mainline Metal Gear game you can play on the bus. Its aesthetic elements are pared down. Animatic comic book style cutscenes replace what the PSP could never produce. You know 
hours of rendered cutscenes. It functionally departs from the established gameplay of the series while retaining the gist of Snake Eater and 4's mechanics. And you might be wondering, why is this a mainline game at all? I mean, it's worth an ask. I'd argue, playing these back-to-back, -back, that MGS did best wowing audiences with campy but sharp cinematic experiences. It's got an energy that looks like typical gaming at a glance, but is wholly extraordinary to actually immerse in, to cleanse in a bath of piss. It's not like the cutscenes are bad or overly expository, it's still Metal Gear, but it doesn't have that gravitas. At least it's a fun game. I mean, it's some of the best Metal Gear you'll ever play on handheld. You sneak through bite-sized levels, a million micro-stealth experiences, purposely segmented for online play integration. You do a lot of what you'd expect. Tranquilize guards, a little CQC, just murder. And like Snake Eater, it doesn't really mind how you choose to handle situations, though you're locked into your loadouts, so no camo switching. Only two gun slots, uh, you're always making some kind of progress, whether that's beating levels in minutes, building up your arsenal and new menu systems, it's solid portable fun. Mind you, it's more fun on PS4 with the second analog stick, and a hell of a lot easier too. The shakeups lie in the Fulton recovery system and base construction. Basically, you got a little plant, you populate it with dudes you capture in the field. I know, a little ridiculous, but it is fast. And you've got like five or so tabs to manage, from building your own metal gear to sending squads out for rewards, allocating capture captured soldiers appropriately, researching new weapons, it gets kinda heavy part way through, constantly juggling menu stuff when you're trying to play a game that keeps stopping and starting, but you've got to do it. Maybe the devs knew the original controls were a little bunk and would be effectively cracked open if the game was ported, or they just wanted to tack hours onto the thing, a little more likely, but you need a pretty fat arsenal to handle the bosses. Just one small thing, uh, game. Did you miss the gun show? Big Boss is 89 kilograms, commonly known as 196 pounds, of all American shmeef. beef. Definitely meant to say beef. That's not better. <laughs> the bosses are all mechs. Cool departure, minus the personality. What you gonna do? They're fun enough, but devolve into slamming repeat rockets into their shells, calling for ammo drops, loop four times. That's most of them. I will say some, one of them uses their, you know, gigantic mech status for surprisingly cool perspective. It's an impressive amount of rendered space, at least to me, who knows nothing. Once the story winds down, the player's free to engage with all the systems unrestricted. Just enjoy Metal Gear Solid. I have to file a complaint because this goes against my religion? Aesthetic cohesion? So the main reason I'm keeping this section brief is, yeah, it's playable and fun enough, it hits a lot of notes Metal Gear games like to, explores some of Big Boss's relationship with the original boss, but it's best understood in the framework of MGS5, because most of it carries over to that game, from the Fulton system, building Mother Base, generally continuing the tale of Big Boss started in Snake Eater, several characters. I'm glad Kojima had the chance to dive out of the modern day MGS timeline, even if 4 is a bit strained, it probably needed wrapping so he could tell the story he actually wanted to, about the American who had no country, for his ass belonged to the world. Why'd I play these games? Just to suffer. Every night, I can feel my arm, my wrist, even my fingers. The time I've lost, the potential I've lost, sacrificed on the altar of games. You feel it too, don't you? Okay, MGS5. Yeehaw, partner. I'm looking over the footage with actual nostalgia for a game I played just recently. It's something I always want another crack at, but I can't help remembering everything else. <laughs> What, he looked a little hungry. MGS5 is prequeled by Ground Zeroes, a standalone title of a single hour. Okay. And it's necessary to understand the game and twist ending. Here's the premise. In the previous game, Paz, which means peace, do you get it, did some bad stuff, apparently lived, and was captured. It's bigger than that, but you recover her, and the helicopter you carry her away in explodes, leaving Big Boss in a coma for nine years. What follows is what I can only describe as the bones of a plot that almost totally surrender pacing to the open-world gameplay and evolved Peace Walker mission structure. I wonder what longtime fans thought about Getting Ground Zeroes, this fairly tight stealth experience with all-new additions. Ready? Very modern Metal Gear, only for the curtain to part on this large, barren world. Look, it's not the worst thing ever. Metal Gear games have been reinventing themselves since the second entry. Little things change, but the core inspirations are always present, for better or worse. The identity never totally transforms. If anything, Peace Walker was a warning. But not everything's changed. It's still willing to make you drag yourself through an hour-long narrative sponge cake, base bake, 
What the f*** am I writing? And we're uncomfortable, we're vulnerable, we're pissing our pants again. Just kidding, that's IV fluid, and we're getting driven mentally insane by the constant, shrieking, horrifying scenarios you'd be forgiven for assuming MGS took a survival horror detour. My jaw didn't drop until I saw the flaming whale though. It's fun to see an old friend. That magic realism was almost entirely non-existent in 4. It's like Kojima wants to maintain two literary spheres in his own conceptual universe. More interesting are the nods to the Wild West and its tall tales. MGS5 swipes the West's boots and breaks him in on the desert sands of Afghanistan. Look out for that Kojima man, he's <laughs> insane. He'll go there. That's just it. Is this genius or awful? Really, who can say? From there, you're let loose in the open world. I don't cover a lot of open world titles, so let's remember remember why they catch a lot of flack. Huge barren areas with little to no personality, meaningfully planned and novel content can't be placed in every area. The budget simply does not exist. So the player ends up repeating drag and drop content ad nauseum. Story pacing often suffers due to player freedom and non-linearity, travel times and loading screens. Okay, so how about the good? You can put a lot of sh in it. Ah, but there's the rub. Most open worlds aren't mechanically complex enough to offer a girthy gameplay experience. But this is Metal Gear. Big Boss got girth, and MGS5 gives the player this incredibly robust, enjoyable control scheme to master and a whole arsenal to play with. You want to try that? You can probably do that. If you want to play Ghost, have fun. If you want to get painted, bombs away. If you stop running out of things to try, you've been playing for 50 hours, or you've cut your imagination at the stem. Literally slit your spinal cord. MGS5 is an open world, but because of its mechanics, much greater opportunities for emergent play occur naturally during missions. For example, early on I was supposed to infiltrate this heavily guarded base and I wasted my silencer, but I encountered this guy on a machine gun mounted walker gear, sniped him off, jacked the thing, and ran around in the night causing mayhem, blowing up helicopters, and it wasn't this elegant gameplay moment, it was an opportunity that I took and ran with, and the game's full of moments like these, especially later on when your arsenal and capabilities are dramatically expanded. All that warmth I got looking over the footage was tinged with pride for creating my own playthrough. They managed to take the best aspect of Snake Eater's gameplay and infuse it into a non-linear experience. I think this is a really tactical moment to mention Nintendo games almost never drop in price, and I got this for six bucks on sale. Literally the best six I ever spent. Unfortunately, it's not all whiskey and lemon drops. Sometimes you're bogged down in segments of extremely limited scope, at least by by comparison to the rest of the game, or worse, segments that are super easy with X or Y weapon that you haven't unlocked, or totally trivial with Quiet. Yeah, Quiet, that character. The one you sniper duel, that one. Yeah, yeah, I know her. Thankfully, you can get her later, and I did save your comments. It so happened that for every two missions, there was at least one unfun to miserable time. Missions that have no narrative importance. Missions that really should be side missions, but there they are, gumming up the main quest set. So game flow feels bloated, purposely, at times. I mean, there's 50 main missions, and about 20 or fewer have any actual substance. And yeah, these systems are great. I'm having fun, but there's so much to wade through. And understandably, it'd be offset if I weren't playing games on a schedule. You know, even for the hard missions, they included the chicken hat option if you really need to get through. And hey, if it smooths the experience out, I'm grateful Kojima is considering accessibility and the potential of loose design in this 30 to 50 hour game. The early game is oddly reminiscent of the older Metal Gear titles. Fewer options make for tougher play, or rather, tougher stealth play. In short, you've got to work really hard early on to get a good silencer. So when I say the devs don't really care if you stealth it or not, I mean they really do not care. Stealth's optional for about 99% of the game. Most times you're forced into open combat by sheer player inability, lack of silencer durability, things made of paper, I swear. And it turns what was once a considered long crawl into a real soldier of fortune war game. And I don't really mind so much, but in a stealth game like Dishonored or Thief Deadly Shadows, resorting to violence shows a kind of frustration with the mechanics, something not clicking or the red method being more enjoyable, expedient rewarding. It makes narrative sense. Big Boss ends up a villain, and this particular version of Big Boss is still learning how to be. But I think it'd be nicer notched once more in the player's favor, that's all. These frustrations can carry over to MGS5's many systems and menus as well. Like I said, Peace Walker laid the groundwork, and you'll be farming quality soldiers in the field, allocating them to different teams in the base, developing new equipment, developing the base, developing forward bases, listening to audio tapes because thank god it wasn't all in cutscenes, doing 
doing side missions, gathering plants. Oh yeah, the entire online system too. If I had time, man, if I had the time, but instead I'm just sitting here looking like this. Yeah, thanks for all the menus and options and the hologram producing iPod. Where are we dropping next? It can drag, but by the end you transcend, become the boss, master the mechanics, make a million bucks, and it's all worth it. But you're worn out, punished, if you will. But wait, exposition in audio tapes? What did they do for this story? That's like cutting half the content. It's actually handled a lot better. Okay, in some ways. It clearly worse than others. Let's break it down. So in previous titles, information was handled like, Has anyone really been far even as decided to use even go want to do look more like? Shut the hell up, you babbling swine! And the game's still kind of unsure about delivering info at times. There's a real currently available scene where you infiltrate an enemy base, come face to face with the bad guy, he walks you to his car, you sit down, and he monologues at you for like five minutes straight. Right. Then the dialogue ends and you sit in stark silence, a ruler apart for at least a minute or two more. I was crying. Fuck! Boss looked at him weird and he's like, I don't guess we'll never talk again. Mind you, his motivation and ideas are interesting if, uh, let's call him supported only by necessary assumptions. So Skullface believes imperialism is evil, which, yeah, it's up there. And he wants to wipe out English, the language, with vocal cord parasites. Weird, but... Metal Gear. I think it's a bit heady and won't land for the average player, especially because his entire plan assumes that the world won't just adapt a new lingua franca, another commoner language. It's like thinking nerfing a top tier character won't just make a new top tier. The next down the line. What's good, Skullface? You don't think Mandarin's up next? If you nerfed Yon, it would just be Chun Li. Whatever his assumptions, he's clearly pathologically warped by the need for revenge, and as a theme, it carries at least the main crew, Vol'jin, and Eli as characters as well at least it's consistent. But, broadly, MGS5 cuts down on cutscenes, spaces them far apart, shortens them, and the unfortunate consequence is a story that feels disjointed, incomplete, but isn't that the point? If you don't know the twist, I won't spoil it here, but suffice it to say that Big Boss is living a lie, doing what he feels he needs to do again after Mother Base was totaled at the end of Peace Walker, and he's only headed to a bad end in the original Metal Gear games, chronologically speaking. He's joined by so many faces familiar to the player, it feels just like a Metal Gear game, at least in its many familiar pieces, but it isn't. It's not a linear crawl through a series of interesting scenes with twists and reveals, because the large open space necessitated by the open world gameplay is filled by the player. In the end, as characters you bring close recede, relationships end, and things fall away, you're left only with what you've built and done. The player is Big Boss, a living legend defined by his actions, good or ill. I gotta say, playing the game I wasn't big on it, but writing about the experience is making me feel things. And for me, the true climax has nothing to do with Skullface or Sahoanthropus or any of that stuff, but rather the incredibly uncomfortable quarantine scene. Kojima is not new to the uncomfortable. Peace Walker was a partial dive out of the old games. One thing Big Boss can do that Snake never really could is be a leader of a squad. Snake worked best alone, made mention of it multiple times. Big Boss was consistently surrounded by people who adored him, people who were aware of his legendary soldier status and wanted to work for him. MGS5 takes all that goodwill, people willing to take hits from from you, people who want you to harm them to learn something, people who will salute you as you walk by, whose morale is raised by your very presence, who utterly defer to you and makes you kill them one by one. It's not the whole base, it's just the quarantined units, but it is the most wholly uncomfortable thing I have ever sat through in video games, period. That kind of emotional climax is the very reason MGS5 does not end at Mission 30. A strong argument for games as art. Not that that was really in question, just that it's a clear integration of gameplay and story. My favorite true combo, gameplay into sad. Oof. To sum up the series, it captured an audience, entertained them consistently, but when it came time to move on, expectation became the thief of joy, and the games uprooted, stole away from cinematic linearity to build an entirely separate legacy on the very foundation laid long ago. Metal Gear may very well have dissipated, but its spirit is undispellable. Hey, it's K-Bash. Special thanks goes out to my $4 patrons, whose names are on the screen. The show's on its way somewhere good thanks to the community's generosity. And special thanks goes out to my extra generous patrons, who are... 
Alexa, Andy Blarg, Arch, Basement Dweller, Boha, Brios, Cal, Can I Cuss on Here? Caesar T, Cordant, Chris A, Christo009, Cody Golden, Corgi the Lad, Couch Moba, CW Glassworks, Kyle Lapreed, Daddy Dagoth, Dakota Storm Jones, Dondium, Danky Stank Swanky Make, Dara, David Castillo, Den Het, Desdemona, Dylan Coffee, 8 Bit Funk, LPO, Elsa, Annex, Aesthetico, Exa, Frankenstitch, Glyph Seeker, Guard Cory, Gucci Plant, Hatsune Miku's Crack House, Harkaj, Heman Gaiman Station, Huey, Ingenious Clown, I Punched a Sandwich, Irradiated Cherries, Ice Kyle, Ivy Ruth Langley, Jason Lasky, Jaden, J. Deus, John Weber, Joke Frog, Keegan Too Cool, Clocked, Craden, Crazy Dark Chocolate, Latrix, Laundry Mom, Lego Sid, Loki, Lawn, Lucas Boyd, Magical Madman, Markules, Maximilian Wolfgang Niver, Mike DeVR, Milky Moo Official, Michelanius, Mr. Dodongo, Nairino, Nito Torpedo, Old Burgle, Old Man Cranberry, Only LK, Gaplant, PK Gaming, Quasar McDougal, Quillworth, Quinn, Reasonable Willow, Reggie Rodriguez, Ricochet Frame, Sagit Trash, Siren Smells Good, Salty Smasher, Sam Vertigo, Sekai Noa Shod, Silver Bear 909, Simp God, Sleepy Wabbit, Space Lizard, Special Children, Spooky Grimalkin, Squishward, Sublime Cataclysm, Super Katsanova, Super Sandwich Guy, TFY Lex, The Big Bubby, The Salt Knight, Thrips Heartrop, Travis Edwards, Twiddle Chungus, V01156, Vid, Venom, Vice Pup, Viewers Like You, Vic, Walter Taggart, Waposa, Weeb Trash, Well Shit, Zanny Tanner, Yay Kundo, Zachary Livesey, Zachary V, Zanasso, Zane the Impure, Zane the Pure, Zed Slayer Gamer, Cyberbunk. If you'd like to help support the show and make it even better, check out my Patreon. We've got all kinds of goals and lots of rewards in store. Stay tuned for more. K Bash out.